Hello everyone and welcome to part 13 of this Hackolate tutorial. In this tutorial we're going to be talking about something that's very very special and very very dear to our heart which is the polyglot data model. We sometimes think of this as one of the pillars of the Hackolate toolset. Uh, it's quite unique and quite differentiating. So what do, we, what do we mean with that? What do we mean with a polyglot data model? Well, it's actually a little bit special. It's a little bit special because it's a common physical model that you implement across a wide number of different underlying target physical models, right? So in that sense, it is similar, but it's also different from a logical model as we used to know it in the past. We have a really nice article uh, for you to read on that, but trying to summarize it here, a polyglot data model is similar to a logical data model in the sense that it is technology agnostic. It's not dependent on the specifics of the implementation of the underlying target. Right? But we think it's actually truly technology agnostic because it, accom it accommodates a lot of different types of data models, not just relational data models. Right? So we can generate physical schemas for a variety of different technologies automatically and map the specifics and the specific data types of these technologies automatically to this overarching common physical model. Right? Therefore, we've implemented a couple of things that are different, very different from a logical model. Specifically, we allow for denormalization at this polyglot data model level. Right? Not, not always mandatory, not always desired, but for specific access patterns, this is really, really useful. And it also allows for complex data types. We've talked about that before in our tutorial, right? Nested structures, object structures, arrays, you know, those types of things are permitted in that polyglot data model. It also allows for some conceptual modeling concepts to be applied by using something we call a graph view. It's a higher level representation of the business terms, the business concepts that we use in our data models, and therefore very useful to bridge the gap between our technologists and our business stakeholders. We would like to remind everyone that we're not big fans of creating huge, you know, uh, thousands of entities types of uh, data models. We think it's useful to apply the principles of domain-driven design in domain-driven data modeling, right, by breaking down complex models into smaller ones, right, and therefore um, polyglot data models have a really, really useful role to play there. Right, so it's separate from a physical model, but it's related, right? There is a link between those physical models and the polyglot model, right? We are going to try to ensure consistency across all implementations by having lineage between those different models. We're going to use something that is similar to external definitions, right? Linking things together, right? Referring from one model to another model at the model level. It's important to understand, however, that the polyglot data model once you start using it, will become the master from which all of the target models are derived. Right? So changes are to be made at that master level as much as possible. We will obviously try to accommodate deviations, additions, changes, deletions, and you know, obviously there's nothing wrong with it if you have to do that, but think twice when you do. You probably want to try and maximize the number of changes at the master level, at the polyglot level. So how do you create one? How do you create a polyglot model? Well, um, it's just another data model, right? So when you create a new Hackolade model, you can choose to say, okay, I'm going to do this in a polyglot way and I'm going to start with the master. I'm going to create the polyglot model first, right? That's a definite possibility. But many times you will actually start from something that exists already, right? You start from a physical target model that you already have and you promote that. You promote that into a polyglot model. Right, so we promote the physical data model that we have into a polyglot model and then we say, okay, now this thing is the master and we're going to work with that master and we're going to start deriving all kinds of other models from that master from here on onwards. Right? Deriving a target data model right, uh, is something that you always have to do if you want to have the uh, polyglot model have some kind of forward engineering. You cannot forward engineer a polyglot model directly, but right? you first have to create a derived target model from the polyglot model and then continue onwards from there. Right? So all of those operations are taking place at the target model level, right? and you pull information from the polyglot model into the target model. Right? So the target model is always the slave, it's always pulling information from the master. Right? 
Um, it's not all or nothing, right? So you can be quite granular in the sense that you can choose which entities, which parts of the polyglot model you want to pull into your derived model, and uh, you have a lot of flexibility there, right? One of the things that uh, we should mention is that we have some really interesting things that we can do when we do that derivation, when we do derive a target model from a polyglot model. One of the things that we can do is normalization, right? When we derive a relational target model from a denormalized polyglot data model, then Hackalate will say, well, do you want to normalize, right? Is it something that you would want to do? Because we can apply the principles of normalization automatically. You know, the rules are clear. We know how to do that. We know how to go from a denormalized structure into a normalized structure automatically. The reverse is very different, right? Going from a, a normalized structure to a denormalized structure requires insight into the access patterns. That's not always automatable, right? So therefore, we recommend that at the master level, we allow for denormalization and then apply normalization when and if you need it at the lower level, at the physical target level. Another important concept that I should explain here is the fact that you can combine multiple polyglot models together into one physical target model. You can see this in the picture, right? You have the blue boxes, you have the red circles, and you have the uh, uh, green uh, triangles. All of those are at the polyglot level, so, so those are um, uh, polyglot data models and entities at the polyglot level. But in the physical target that you derive from it, you can combine more than one polyglot level um, entity into uh, a particular target A or target B. Right? So you can really um, mix and match there. And this is sometimes really, really useful, especially as we move towards uh, concepts like um, uh, domain-driven data modeling. We can make adjustments, minor deviations if at all possible, right? like changing properties or adding a few entities or removing a few entities. That's obviously possible at the target level, um, but if at all possible, we would like to have those updates of the target model be driven by the master, be driven by the polyglot model. Right? So the polyglot model changes, well then those changes will be updated in the target data model by either doing some kind of a manual refresh, right? there's a sync uh, option in the target data model, or by closing and reopening the target data model and then it will ask you, okay, uh, are you sure that you want to update? When it does that, when it asks you that question, it will present you with an impact analysis. You see this on the screen here? It will tell you, okay, this is what will happen if you update this target model from the master, from your, from your polyglot model, right? What is it that you want to approve? What is it that you want to allow? Or do you potentially want to break the link, right? You need to be uh, thinking uh, clearly about this, right? So this is how you update it. So with that, I'm going to actually um, take some time and show you a few things, and then we can come back a little bit later and go over some of the reading materials. All right, here we go. So what I've got here is a uh, target physical model for a MongoDB database. I've actually reverse engineered this uh, database from a MongoDB instance that is running in their Atlas cloud. Um, so this is the document-oriented data model, right? So where I've got movies, I've got comments, I've got users, all these different things, right? Um, and you can see that we're leveraging the power of the document data model, right? There's a nested structure here, a little bit more complex than uh, your typical relational model. So what we're going to do now is we're going to convert this model, we're going to promote it to a um, polyglot data model, right? That's a really easy operation. I can go right here, I can say, okay, convert this to a polyglot model. Okay, so here I choose how I want to handle the paths, right? Let's just take an absolute path here for now. I'm going to put this in my tutorial uh, directory and I'm going to say, okay, this is the polyglot version which I had already prepared, but I'll just replace it here, right? So overwrite it, overwrite it, and now I'm going to open this new model and then you will actually see that the polyglot data model is extremely similar to the uh, MongoDB data model. Obviously it would be, right? Because it's representing the same data structure. But you can see here, right? So this is the polyglot model, right? And um, it, it's really looking exactly the same. However, there are a few things that are a little bit different here, right? So at the bottom, you can see, obviously, we've got the same ER diagram, right? It's, it's looking exactly the same. Um, but it also has a graph diagram that represents the concepts that we're dealing with in this uh, data model at a, a little bit of a higher level. It's, uh, it's drawn.
it's inspiration from how we do graph database modeling, right? Um, entities that are connected to each other with, with relationships, right? So now we've got the MongoDB model, right? And I've got the Polyglot model. I'm going to shut down this one, right? Uh, I'm going to shut down the uh, uh, MongoDB model, and I just have the Polyglot model uh, available here. And I'll just um, make a change here, or I'll add an, add an attribute here to this um, uh, entity, to the movies entity, right? So I'll just uh, add something, a new attribute. I'll call this the tutorial attribute, right? So you can see it now, right? I've just... Uh, um, added this new attribute here and I'll save this one and now uh, remember we're dealing with the polyglot model here right now if I now go back and I open the MongoDB model it's hopefully going to say well hey you want to uh, update this because the polyglot model has actually changed right so I'll go back here and I'll grab the poly the MongoDB model right that's this one this is the polyglot one this is the MongoDB model right so I'll open the MongoDB model and it's going to say well your model contains references to polyglot definitions. Would you like to update them? Yes, I would, right? And then it's going to show me, you know, the impact of the change that has happened, right? So here you see it, right? The tutorial attribute has been added to the polyglot model and therefore it's now going to update the target model. Let's apply that, right? And now uh, we're going to have this new attribute here in the MongoDB model, right? Not just in the polyglot model. Hopefully that's clear. Now, I'd like to show you something else, which is that um, I am going to derive a new model from the polyglot model, right? So I'll create a Postgres model now, right, from the, and I'm going to say, okay, this Postgres model is going to be derived from the polyglot model. The polyglot model that I just uh, created, which is the MongoDB uh, original model, right, but the polyglot version of that. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to um, get a screen where I can select which entities I want to have added to my Postgres model, right? So I've got all of the entities that are in the Polyglot model with all of their uh, nested structures. And I can say, okay, which ones would you like to have included here, right? And now I'm just not going to do everything. I'm just going to get the movies in, in this uh, uh, Postgres model. Uh, but I am going to say, why don't you normalize these complex data types for me into separate entities, right? So this should be interesting, right? Because we can, like I said earlier, you know, we can automate the normalization of a denormalized structure. It's much, it's much harder to uh, denormalize a normalized structure as that would depend on the access patterns. But this should be possible. This should be interesting, right? It's going to give me a normalized version, as you can tell, for, of the uh, movies entity, Right, so the, this, these are now flat structures, right, where movies are over here, languages are in a separate table, genres are in a separate table. All of the nested structures that we used to see in the original MongoDB model, as well as in the polyglot, polyglot model that um, we converted it into, are now all in this Postgres model. So this is how we can work with this, right? We can actually, you, know, you can see here, right? The tutorial attribute is also in here because that's the one that we added to the um, polyglot model. Uh, so this is now a, n another derived model from the polyglot model that we created. And another great way that you can leverage this uh, polyglot data model that we've created here is by uh, working this into, for example, uh, an Avro schema, right? Something that you can leverage uh, with your Kafka implementation or uh, potentially also you know, something that you could uh, use to create an API or something like that, right? So leverage this polyglot model that you have right here for other types of data structures, not just databases, but something else as well. Now, how are we going to do that? Let's create an Avro schema. Let's create an Avro schema here, which we are going to um, derive from that polyglot model that we just um, looked at, right? So I'm going to go into my tutorial directory again, and I'm going to uh, grab the polyglot model that I have over here. It's going to do exactly the same thing. It's going to ask me uh, which entities do I want to have be part of this Avro schema. I'll just focus on the movies here again, right? And here it's going to do what I just um, uh, did as well for the relational database, which is it's going to give me the Avro schema for the movies um, entity, right? So I can now push this into my um, schema registry uh, if I wanted to. So that's another example. I, there's uh, plenty of other 
examples that we could um, uh, come up with. You can derive these models from the polyglot model really, really easy. And so with that, I'll wrap up this part of the demo and um, go into the final uh, part of our tutorial here. So here we are, uh, wrapping up this uh, 13th part of our tutorial. Uh, reading material, you know, we've shown this slide a couple of times before, but it's so full of fantastic uh, material. Our documentation, the blog, the fantastic MongoDB data modeling and schema design book, and of course, all of the different um, social media uh, activities. Um, I would also highly recommend that you try this out yourself and download the product. And with that, I'm going to wrap up this part of the tutorial and wish you a wonderful rest of your day.